is it worth us rallying in Canberra and organising regional buses from all over Australia? That's it might be worth doing like a simultaneous action where we turn up at all local MP offices and know and Department of Foreign Affairs on a certain date and uh, and you know especially leading up to the the extradition hearing at the end of February. Yeah. If, if, if anybody organise just to vote in, if anybody organises something like that and wants it mass communicated, I can send an email to 224,000 people. Great. Great. In the unlikely, perhaps unlikely scenario that Sir Jeremy Corbyn got a majority, is, is there a thread of hope if he were to get in? That's not unlikely. He's going to win. I know, but all, all the, poll, the polls were wrong here. The polls were wrong in the States. He's going to win. Uh, Jeremy has made a good, very good statement. Uh, uh, in support of Julian Diane Abbott, uh, his, one of his senior shadow ministers has equally made a, a very strong statement. And two of uh, Jeremy's advisors are, are close friends. So that, and also <laughs> a friend of Jeremy, John Rees, is running the entire UK uh, Julian Assange campaign. Yes. Firstly, I'm a, I'm a Catholic anarchist pacifist, so I'm a member of a very small tendency in this movement. But I think uh, that Jeremy Corbyn has integrity, he's got a history uh, with most carriages of justice, like the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six. Um, and, uh, I, and, not, and when Julian was taken from the embassy, both he and Diane Abbott made very strong statements that this should not be extradited to the United States. So. I work for Sea Shepherd, and um, I think uh, the Captain Paul Watson is one of the greatest um, activists on the planet. And I was wondering if either of you had thought to um, enlist his help with Julian, because he knows everyone. And he's pretty, uh, he's, he's an extraordinary mind, incredibly um, uh, uh, cooperative. And I have read um, articles where he's, um, completely condemned uh, what's happened to Julian Assange. So I just think it's a really good idea to get in touch with Paul Watson because he's got, um, yeah, he's an incredible strategist, etc. knows, you know, the highest level of governments um, all over the world. So it's just a thought. We were, um, when, uh, back in 2013, we worked closely with uh, C. Yeah. Shepherd and Paul is a, a good friend uh, and an advisor, yes. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, my, um, my no budget, no net way of organising is to get people to do stuff they're already good at in a, in a, in a political context. And my history with this has been nine years, but in the March of 2018, the day they turned the internet off, I was asked to move into Hans Crescent. Um, which I did, and I expected to be joined by lots of people, you know, like Iwo Jima, like the first beach landing, and then the next and next, and, and it, was, it was pretty sparse, you know, but it was amazing to witness the build-up, the special branch visibly parked there 24-7, them having an apartment directly opposite. Uh, they were taking this very, very seriously. They take our movement very seriously. We don't take ourselves serious enough. You know, we, we've got to begin to take ourselves seriously. and. Uh, you know, I met Ross, is it Ross, who, who came to visit uh, outside the Belmarsh prison um, and all sorts of people. Uh, you know, for me, my, my Catholicity, it's important to go where the oppression is and witness to what's happening. And it's not just a great loss to Julian that the internet was turned off. We were missing his analysis and that the nourishment his insights give and all that kind of stuff. And he became increasingly invisible with, with that switching off in March 8, 2018. Thank you. I'm German and I moved here to this beautiful country about three and a half years ago. And I can only say um, this will go around the world. I will send it to Europe and to the Philippines and to Cyprus where all independent journalists sit that basically cannot even work in Europe. And my word of cautious and warning is as well, don't look at papers and go, it's better in Germany or it's better in France. It's 
exactly the same thing. So what these people try is always to paint somewhere a picture that you think, oh my God, this is um, definitely, the Germans are more in support and I totally agree. I know members of parliament, I used to work with the Ministry of Finance and I can tell you the reason why I'm campaigning and the reason why I'm behind here is simple people, not powerful people, because they use you any time of the day to basically be influenced and you can be, to your point, I stand at Hans Crescent quite a few times and I was escorted away as well because I think it's so important. You can be 100% sure there's somebody from the Secret Service in here tonight. They take this very serious, so please, even if it's Madam Bimbi, I'm here, I have to drive an hour and a half, but you know what, that is worth it and just to see other people and experience this is just the greatest thing and that will make it work. The only word that I have is, if I look around, I would like to know how many people are below 50 in this room. Because the challenge going forward is to take an 18 year old, a 20 year old or a 10 year old. My little daughter here is three years old. And the reason why I'm campaigning and why I'm looking at this is because I brought somebody in this world that I have the responsibility for to stand up and say, at least I tried. And so speak to the young people and give them an idea who Julian Assange is and why he's basically put away and tortured because there's no other word for it. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before you get a chance to uh, answer or put your question, I'm an activist journalist and I often wonder why people say things like, what can we do? Because in this, in this region, we've got the knitting nanas, who I think have got more honesty and unrespected and unrealised power than any other group in Australia. Because what they're doing is they're actually talking truth to power by being annoying people <laughs> to politicians and making and disrupting their life. And I often wonder why people don't spend more time laughing at them, laughing at, at, at power, because they are so bloody stupid. And one of my mates rings up, every few days he rings up a politician and gives them an earful. <laughs> and, and, I, and I wonder why more people don't do that. Honestly, these are moronically stupid people and it's about time we all spoke truth to power and it's a lot more entertaining to do that, I can assure you, than standing at a picket for half an hour where nobody watches you and nothing much happens. Thank you. Um, they're making legislation at the moment, or they're working on it, to protect whistleblowers. Well, why isn't Julian Sarge being um, brought into this legislation? Am I, am I right? I've heard it on the wireless that they're bringing in legislation to protect whistleblowers. Any laws to protect whistleblowers in Australia, whether or not that would help Julian Assange, is that right? Oh, no, that wouldn't, um, it wouldn't help at all. Um, it would be good for future whistleblowers, though. Uh, what, would, what will help Julian is diplomatic action at the ministerial level by the Australian government. That will help. That will solve. That's the way to get action. That's the way to get noticed. That's the way to change things. Yeah, you need creative tension here. Yeah, yeah. But just two experiences from living there for five months outside the embassy. Uh, one from the previous, the, the German fellow, um, uh, like I was literally sleeping on the road to begin with on a sleeping mat and then made a bit of a gunya. And then three guys came along, a German, a Polish guy and a uh, Belgian. And they built me what looked like a coffin. And it was really an upgrade. Um, and it really was. It was so warm and dry and stuff like that. So, you know, they had very specific skills, you know. And the, the Polish guy went to a local church and to the minister and said, oh, we just need the space in your churchyard to build this thing for four hours. 
And uh, the vicar goes, you know, he's obviously a very bourgeois vicar to get the gig at Knightsbridge. Uh, he goes, uh, well, I, I can't offer you any hope. And the Polish guy goes, if the church can't offer us any hope, why don't it? <laughs> and, uh, so they went down there and they built the thing. And uh, the thing about, yeah, I was sitting out there one day and getting very grumpy about the whole situation. And this huge African-American guy with a posse of four other guys walked by and he said, is this where Assange is? And he started yelling insults and I was just, you know, really pissed off. And he was a big guy. And I, I just jumped off the box and, you know, I forgot I was a pacifist and all that, and ran up to him. And as I was coming to him, he started, like, dancing, you know? Uh, anyway, I said, look, mate, you know, he's a friend of mine and all this kind of stuff. And I said, uh, I spent a year in jail in your country. And he went, I spent three years in jail in my country. <laughs> I said, oh, what jail's you in? And uh, I said, oh, my name's Kieran O'Reilly. So I said, what's your name? And he said, I'm Shannon the Cannon Beggs, two-time heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> So you've got to be very cautious how you're approaching people and who you're approaching. So we're all here, I believe, because there were leaks that have had incredible impact on each and every one of us here. And I wanted to ask each of you what has been the most powerful leak that has had an impact on your life and your activism. Well, I think what is significant is that the, the changing nature of warfare, you know, like during Vietnam, they needed your first born son. World War II, you know, rationing, the whole country was mobilised for war. And all they want from us now to wage their wars is to avert our gaze, to look the other way. Yeah. Now, if Chelsea Manning had done that in Baghdad, Chelsea Manning would not have been tortured, imprisoned, wouldn't be in prison today. And uh, these are people born like I am, like we all are, most of us, born into privilege, born into the centre of empire, you know, the first world, and all we have to do is look the other way, don't hear the screams from Timor or Afghanistan, and, and get on, you know, go on, get by by getting by, and uh, so I think it was incredibly courageous of Chelsea uh, to do what she did, and uh, incredibly courageous of Julian and WikiLeaks to do what they did, and these are, I'm not at all techie, you know, I'm from another subculture at all, and, and to go and visit Julian in the embassy, and you know, uh, and to, to find something in common, even though we have different gifts and are from different backgrounds. But it, and then to leave him there was very sad. Uh, so, and it's, uh, that was seven years, you know, sensory deprivation. And now he's in a Category A prison. And, um, you know, you, most, uh, most of the day I don't even think about it. I'm numb to that reality and sometimes it just hits me right then, you know. So the revelation that he is a human being uh, that he's not to be romanticised or demonised, but be treated like a human being, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a very good question for me. Uh, you know, the, uh, for me, the, uh, I don't, that didn't affect my life uh, uh, at all. Um, but a, a good example of their effect is the Chagos Islands. The, all of the Chagos Islanders were moved to Mauritius. Uh, I forget the number of 3,000, I think, or 33,000. All of them, every single one. And the Air Force base called Diego Garcia built where they take B-52 bombs to bomb. Well, anyway, soldiers these days, they war against civilians. They don't war against other soldiers. It's too dangerous. Um, the Chagos Islanders saw the, uh, their rep legal representatives saw the, the cables and looked in the cables. And in the cables was enough evidentiary weight to take a course, take a, an action to the International Court of Justice, which they did and won. Very good. You know, when Korea first became president of the uh, of Ecuador, he read the cables and found that the elite in the police force received money from the US Embassy. So the elite 
worthy to leave because they've got more money. Now this is a problem if you're governing a country that you have the elite of the police force loyal to the US Embassy. So he solved it by raising everybody's wages. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Given the direction that Australia seems to be going in at the moment politically, what do you expect will happen to Julian Assange if he does come home? We have a, a very easy extradition process from Australia. There already is a deportation order against Julian for expiation of visa but from by the United Kingdom. Uh, so he would come here. But uh, yeah, that would be another problem. So we'd start again. We'd have another meeting here on how to stop Australia from extraditing Julian to the United States. Like I, I think what John said earlier, that the US is an empire and it sees us as subjects. You know? <laughs> like I was in jail in Texas when they were bringing Noriega back from, who's the head of a country, Panama, and they'll bring him back to put him on trial in Florida. And this guy opposite me, me said, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but he said, this is the first time they've taken a head of state like that back to the country since Cleopatra. <laughs> and yeah, so, and, you know, my experience in court when we were being sentenced uh, for the B-52 in uh, Syracuse, New York, was, you know, we had 150 people in there, the judge started sentencing us, we got up and interrupted the judge, our people started suggesting things to the judge, we were all dragged out by the FBI, and then the door opened and three guys in suits walked in, and I said to the marshal of the court, I said, who are those guys? They said, that's the Australian Embassy. So they'd been there all morning, they didn't come up to me and say, you're an Australian citizen, we're here to watch the treated correctly, they just hung out with the FBI all morning, yeah. working out how to put me in jail. And that was their attitude to David Hicks. Yeah. And, you know, if you're in trouble for politically, you're probably going to get a better deal off them if you're in trouble for drugs in Thailand. Yeah. Not that I resent that. Than uh, if, for politics of the United States, you know. And it's like, how, how can we serve them up? And how quickly can we do that? And, you know, I've been away for quite a bit, and coming back, I'm just struck how overtly cruel this place is, you know? And, uh, like the British are like disingenuous, like they'll piss on you and tell you it's raining. The Australians will piss on you and give you a weather forecast and next time they're gonna piss on you if you're indigenous or a refugee or something. And these guys swagger around like they're macho and tough. And it's, I, I can just imagine Peter Dutton, I was bashed in the police station when I was 17 with Mark Farmer from Nimbin and uh, I just imagine Peter Dutton standing at the door of that cell, you know? Yeah. And um, they're really brave bullies when they're picking on the defenceless. Yeah. But when they stand in front of the United States, they shit themselves. Yeah. They're like timid, 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 you know. And uh, but at the same time, they're like swaggering around, you know? openly cruel, and they, they confuse cynicism with wisdom. They really do. Thank you. Don't forget to register for support. Go to